Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline. Talked, uh, joined today at the Advanced Pediatric Emergency Medicine Assembly here in Orlando, Florida, by Tim Horechko, uh, MD. Um, hopefully, I said that right because he said part of our podcasting goal was to get people to learn how to say correctly his Ukrainian name. And I may have messed it up because that is my MO, is to ask people their name. And then within five minutes of conversation before the onset of the podcast, I completely forget it or say it incorrectly. And so I may or may not, but I'm going to delay a little bit further just so he can come back and uh, tell me whether it's correct or not. But the uh, point of our conversation uh, today is going to be um, on pediatric EKGs. Fantastic talk here. Um, one of, you know, I do a lot of recording and so I don't get a chance to go to a lot of the talks, but actually yesterday was uh, pretty wide open. So I went to a bunch of the discussions and talks and uh, did a great one on pediatric, uh, pediatric EKG. And I think one of the challenges we have in adults, I mean, with adults, you can look at it. And that's why I tell students, look at it. And in your mind, is it is it normal or is there something weird? You don't have to identify exactly what the weird is yet, but is it weird? And that makes you want to run through and look closer and deeper at it. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges we have, and it's going to be especially with pediatrics, is going to be these things that put the reads at the top are inevitably going to lead you in the wrong direction, uh, give you some sort of anchoring bias. You know, if it says um, really the only um, the only accurate reading on those things in many cases is the one that says completely normal, uh, just because they are so they're geared to be so sensitive for any type of abnormality. Um, but a, let's have a conversation on some of these cool tips. You gave some cool things to look for, some things to be worried about, some changes on EKGs, why to be worried. Um, I actually tweeted out, and one of your statements is uh, uh, on on um, heart rates and and investigations and when to get the EKGs and things like that. So uh, first, tell us about yourself, where you hail from, and um, how the EKGs became uh, something that uh, you focus on in pediatric emergency medicine. Thanks, Ryan. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm at Harbor UCLA along with Marianne Gaushi Hill and, and others. Um, so I did EM and then PDM. And to me, the whole point of doing a pediatric emergency medicine fellowship is really just to help my brothers and sisters out in the trenches. Because as an emergency physician, as a general emergency physician, you're trained to take care of children, believe it or not. And even if you don't feel totally comfortable, my whole point of all of this, of the lecture, of just being involved, is to try to convince you that you already know this. And maybe here's some fine-tuning things to make yourself feel a little bit more confident, maybe a little more effective and efficient. But um, really, I'm here for us and for the community. So that sounds very lofty, but uh, I enjoy it. Anyway, you, you were mentioning a little bit about EKGs and maybe that sort of that fear of looking at a pediatric EKG and trying to figure out, well, what do I do with this now? You pat yourself on the back a little bit for to get an EKG in the first place in a child, which is fantastic, because like Amomatu would say, you know, the um, it's already sort of paid for, right? You have the tech is paid for, you have the machine is paid for, the paper doesn't cost much, so it's really just our brains. In emergency medicine, of course, we have two types of patients, really, right? We have the ABC patient and the H&P patient. Mm -hmm. And the ABC patient is the patient that we are trying to treat and stabilize at the same time, whereas the H&P, you have plenty of time to figure out what was their favorite breakfast cereal when they had growing up, and you, you know, you can figure all those things out. Kind of the same thing with diagnostics. There's certain things that we just have to look at and recognize, like you were saying. Um, you know, and if you asked me to interpret an ABG and try to figure out what their mixed uh, status was, I'd have to really sit down and think about it and spend some time. Whereas with an EKG, for many things, we really have to be able to have a knee-jerk reaction to the most dangerous findings. Otherwise, if you don't find any of those major patterns going on, then you really should systematically go through the EKG. But with, with children, because morphologically they look different, we sort of have to input that in our brains. We've seen thousands and thousands of EKGs in our careers, and a lot of them are thrown in front of our face while we're trying to intubate or put a central line in somebody. But um, with children, we need, really need to kind of input what looks normal to us, what doesn't look normal. So we don't see it very often. One thing to remember, well, just the thing, the patterns that we will talk about, is that when you're born, you have a predominant right-sided force, really because you're, the right side of your heart 
is pumping blood through the pulmonary vasculature, but also through the foramen ovale. It really has to do with the workhorse of the, um, of the circulatory system. So we will often see an RSR prime in the anterior leads. We'll see right forces. Uh, and so when you look at a pediatric EKG, you'll look at it and say, wow, there's this almost bun right bundeloid branch uh, pattern in V1, V2. You'll see the flip T waves, the juvenile T waves, totally normal. If you told me there's a five-year-old, I'd say no problem. If you told me there's a 50-year-old chest pain, I'd say, wait a minute, we gotta look into ischemia. So it's all about the ECG and the patient. And once we know there's a child, we can think, okay, the right side of predominance doesn't bother me too much, now what? And the now what is really the patterns that we should talk about. And we talked about five major killers that we can save a life with if we are able to diagnose really just by sight. So. Uh, we talked about WPW, we talked about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, abnormalities in QT intervals, Brugada syndrome, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Um, we can talk about each of those as we go along, but it's sort of, we'll have to be careful, Ryan, because we don't want to lose people about talking about squiggles on an audio podcast. But I think if we, we focus on a few of those things that we already sort of know, but what to focus in on, we'll, we'll do a good job. The right bundle branch block is an interesting aspect of things. It's one of those that um, medical school I had, um, you know, so even getting into your 20s, 30s, um, is potential, especially in males, uh, that, that you're going to see. But I still get referrals to the emergency department for many walk-in clinics. You know, we're, we're getting more and more of these walk-in facilities that are being uh, managed by people with less and less expertise in training and education. And we'll get those referred in, you know, a kid coming in with pleurisy, uh, pleuritic pain, or actually, honestly, more often than not, it's just a kid that's been injured, you know, sport-related injury, you know, been hit in the chest with a ball or football-related injury and come in and have some chest wall soreness, clearly chest wall pain. And the facility, or the walk-in place will get a EKG, see the right bundle branch uh, blocked pattern, read that across the top, and then send them immediately to the ER for a heart attack. And, you know, even, even, you know, even if my 10-year-old daughter were sitting in there, um, you know, she'd be able to, you know, cock her head sideways like the, like the confused puppy look and, and say, what, what the hell is this all supposed to mean? Even though she wouldn't say that because we have her speaking normal, uh, decent American uh, language, not uh, using what we would consider bad words. But you mentioned uh, children, I think, are a little bit more uh, of a challenge because of the... Um, I think we get a little bit pacified with the amount of normal or the amount of insignificant. You know, even with adults, you know, I'm getting 150 EKGs a shift, 100, 150 EKGs a shift easily. You know, just keep getting thrown in front of me. Just everyone that comes into triage, so not just my patients, but everybody's patients are coming in and they're getting slid in front of me. And so it's almost easy to miss the significant one just because the amount of insignificant and the amount of relatively normal or unchanged that we're seeing. And kids, you know, it's even more so. I mean, 95% of kids are coming to the emergency department aren't going to have anything that's going to be time-sensitively important that we have to pick up right away. I mean, for most of us, you know, pediatric emergency room that focuses a uh, referral center type thing, that's, there may be different numbers. But for us, the kids tend to do well. They tend to recover on their own. There tends to not be things that we need to catch right away. And that's especially true with EKGs. There's very little, very few cases that's going to have something that you're going to have to pick up, that you need to pick up, that you don't want to miss, and those those little changes. And so let's talk about those. Let's take your five um, that you talked about and do some of the just bullet point things that you're going to see that you can pick up as an emergency physician, community emergency physician, that you're going to pick up there and say that you don't have to have the complete answer and you don't have to have all the information, but it's something that's going to at least raise your antennas to look deeper or at least get them to that next step of evaluation that they may need. I'm totally with you. As we sort of work in an environment of panic first and, uh, oh, sorry, refer to the ED first, mm -hmm. panic second, and then, you know, cleanse your hands of the patient third. Uh, so in, in a way, we are leaders of acute care. There aren't very many of us, if you think about it, emergency physicians in this country, and there aren't a lot to go around. So part of what we need to do is to 
you know, strengthen our own resources, but also share with others who uh, need a little extra education. But the patterns that we should all focus on, we talked about first WPW, Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, which as we remember is an accessory track. The thing with the accessory track is it may just sit there and do nothing. But the problem is that every once in a while, an impulse can go through that accessory track and either go up and uh, against traffic through the conduction system or actually use the AV node and uh, run out of control. So there's really three different patterns that you'll see with WPW. If someone's asymptomatic, of course, we look for the uh, delta wave, you know, just the slurred delta wave. We may also see what's called the pseudo-infarction pattern in AVL. And all that is, is in your mind's eye, if you can remember, you know, you'll see the delta wave wherever, most likely in anterior leads. But an AVL is sort of looking downwards. And really what you'll see is just the mirror image of the delta wave. So if you can imagine a delta wave inverted, it almost looks like a bad Q wave. It looks like there's some kind of depression, something else is going on. That's okay. That just shows you that you have an accessory track because we remember that the EKG is really a summary of the forces. So you, it, part of the signal is showing that accessory track. It's taking into consideration there's a slurring of that accessory track. It's not a clean conduction. And each lead is telling us just a different perspective of the heart. So you may just see a resting EKG. And in children, that delta can be subtle. So if you get a good history, again, it all starts with history and physical, good history of syncope, chest pain, shortness of breath, something that would prompt you to get an EKG in the first place, you see this slurred, we really need to follow up on it because this child may uh, go into a dangerous rhythm uh, when they're outside of medical help. But for the most part, we're going to see someone who has either an SVT looking pattern, something that looks pretty terrible like a wide complex tachycardia, or really chaotic irregular wide complex tachycardia. So the first one is what's called orthodromic conduction, just going down the AV node like normal, but instead of stopping there and waiting for the AV, which is sort of this kind of regulatory system, uh, unfortunately it shoots back up the accessory track and um, will short circuit the AV's normal, uh, let's just say pausing, pausing uh, mechanism. So you get this out of control uh, SVT looking thing, a narrow complex tachycardia. If you treat that like any other narrow complex tachycardia, it's okay. But truthfully, if you knew this person already had WPW, you should treat them as WPW. And, and I'll just mention that in a moment because I don't want to get us too bogged down with all those details. So you might just see SVT. You might see wide complex tachycardia. And you look at it and say, again, if this is a five year old, I'm thinking it's probably actually SVT with aberrancy. It's about 85% of wide complex tachycardia that is regular in children is going to be SVT with aberrancy. Now, I'm sure that you're listening to this right now and kind of cringing a little bit because uh, what we're taught is you see wide complex tachycardia. What is it, Ryan? Oh, well, it's going to be well. I mean, until proven otherwise. Ventricular tachycardia, yeah, yeah, totally. So I don't want us to feel like, oh, no problem, right? Why complex? No problem. You can treat it like it's VTAC if you don't know. But just to give you a little bit of consolation, it is okay to do a little investigation in someone who's stable. So wide complex tachycardia uh, can show up as WPW. What's happening is it's going down the accessory track first and then back up against the conduction system. And so it's taking longer. It's having to go down a track that's not normally going down. Because it's taking longer, you're having a wider complex. It looks pretty scary. The third one is uh, WPW with atrial fibrillation. This will usually be in a child who already has a cardiac problem. They've already had their cardiac muscle either altered or cut into or something or other causing the atrial fibrillation in the first place. Because in adults, first, what, how do people get atrial fibrillation? You know, smoking too much, eating too much, not doing too much exercise. So in children, though, they'll mostly have it because they have an abnormal heart in the first place. You'll often know that they have that history. They'll come in with a scar, they'll come in with somebody who tells you that. That'll be the scariest looking EKG that we see, right, is this wide complex tachycardia that's irregular. It looks chaotic, it looks terrible. Just Google this when you get a moment and, and you'll see what I'm seeing. In this case, uh, and really in all cases of WPW, we want to avoid AV blocking agents. Because the idea, again, this AV node is really our only chance to reestablish a normal conducting uh, response. If we give something like adenosine, it only lasts not too long and you're just going to basically bottom them out and they'll become unstable. You could probably get them through that within a few minutes, let's hope. 
The problem is if you look at this and say, oh, it's, it's AFib with RVR, I'm just going to give him some metoprolol or some diltiazem, that would be okay if it's, if it's um, uh, an adult who you really feel this is atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. But if you see this chaotic wide complex tachycardia, you give them a longer acting AV nodal blocking agent, you can take that atrial fibrillation take away any regulation from the AV node, and it goes down preferentially the accessory node. So, excuse me, the, yeah, the accessory tract. So you get atrial fibrillation that quickly turns into ventricular fibrillation, and you're stuck. You're, gonna, you're doing CPR on somebody for as long as the diltiazem and the metoprolol is going through, which is not ideally how we like to spend a shift. Mm -mm. Not on a kid. Not, not on anybody, but definitely not on a kid. So the, this kind of draws me to the final really take home, which is, if you see this, you see this wide complex tachycardia, especially if it's someone you suggest, or you, sorry, you are thinking has um, uh, WPW, procainamide is always the right answer. If they're stable, if they're unstable, synchronized cardioversion. The dosages for procainamide, you really should look up. It's not something we do every day, and I, I don't trust myself either, but if you're sitting there and you have that type of personality that needs to know right away, I'm gonna tell you it's uh, gonna be 15.15 milligrams per kilogram per dose, given over 30 minutes, up to a gram. And you do this, you keep giving it slowly until the QRS widens by more, by up to 50%. After that, you have to stop the drip. So that's, but you should always look it up, but if you need to know. And then of course, synchronized cardioversion at 0 0.5 to 1 joules per kilo, up to the adult dose. So those are always the right answer for a wide complex regular tachycardia, wide complex irregular tachycardia, or even an SVT, normal, just narrow complex tachycardia that you are suspecting is WPW. So that's number one. We've made it through Wolf, Parkinson, White. And actually that's one of the ones that, uh, that I think we all know about, but it scares us uh, because we're, we don't see it enough in most community settings um, to get our you know, to get our antenna up enough. So I think it's one that could easily slip by, especially those little data wave, da uh, delta waves. As you mentioned, in young children, they can be very, very subtle. Um, that Q wave at AVL was uh, Q, appearing Q wave on AVL. So as you call it, the uh, pseudo infarction pattern of AVL is uh, actually a very important uh, thing to look for as well. What's next on us? Number two. Number two is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And again, it's something we hear about a lot, but you know, if you're unlucky to have inherited more than 150 different genes to cause this, the problem is that there's all of this um, variable penetrance. Somebody may or may not have symptoms when they're younger, they might have it when they're older. So it should always be on our radar for someone who has syncope with exertion. But of course, you can have someone who presents with CHF-like symptoms and someone that you wouldn't have expected, a younger person, or dysrhythmia at any age. Um, the thing with hokum is that you may or may not be able to diagnose this on the EKG. If it's obvious, you can see it, and we'll talk about when we really should be paying attention and, and notice it for what it is. But if it's somebody clinically that you, su that you suspect, we really need an echo. So that's the bottom line is echo is the diagnosis, mm -hmm. but of course we, won't, we wouldn't want to be dummies, and if we see it on EKG and it's obvious, we really should be prompted to get further workup. So uh, don't use it as a rule out, but if you rule it in by looking at it, let's, let's figure this out. So you're going to see LVH most likely is going to be the tip off. And we talked a little bit about um, the juvenile T waves in normal children that might be T wave inversions. That's normal to see in a young kid. If you see this in an adolescent and you see major LVH and the T waves happen to be inverted, but they're not just sort of happen to be inverted. They're inverted because there's a repolarization issue with the LVH. So you've seen LVH a million times in, the, in, in, a, in an older person. So just realize that you're gonna diagnose this in a preteen or teen as well. It's okay to use the skills that you know from other aspects, other contexts in this context. So the, the other sneaky thing about uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that it's not hokum, it's not necessarily uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy, that's just a sub-segment of it. And so you can have uh, in you can have sub-aortic sub uh, segmental stenosis, that is sort of what we think of as hokum, but you can also have concentric hypertrophy, you can have apical hypertrophy. 
So don't be fooled about um, not seeing these uh, LVH or these dagger-like Q waves that we look for. That's sort of the classic finding in the lateral leads. We see these Q waves that don't look like infarction Q waves. They really are very pointy and, uh, and narrow. That is not normal, especially in the um, setting of LVH. You'll see these intervals, these QRS intervals that will overlap with each other on each lead and you'll say, wow, that is totally abnormal. I need to look into it. And really looking into it is starting with a good history and finding out, hey, what kind of PE do you do? What do you do normally for exercise? And if you get this story of, well, I don't really like PE. I don't like to do, I don't like to run around with my friends. That's not normal for, you know, the typical boy that's going to be diagnosed with this. So we're, we're detectives, like you said, Ryan, we have to constantly try to uh, dig more and more and not just um, put up with uh, a crappy history, right? We really need to make ourselves feel convinced by a reassuring history. And if not, we need to investigate further. So uh, dagger-like Q waves, especially in the lateral leads, LVH is where to go. But if you get a history uh, that is consistent, you should insist on that echo. All right, so we've made it through number two, cardiomyopathy. And actually, I think cardiomyopathy is one that we're likely, not just from the genetic standpoint, I think we're going to see more of it just because of um, the overall health and uh, fitness or lack thereof of our country. You know, my wife does a, a pediatric lipid uh, clinic, and, you know, the number of kids with adult-associated things such as diabetes type 2, liver-related issues, and things like that is just incredible just because of the overall uh, health and lack thereof of our younger population. So I think, you know, that's going to be one that we are likely going to see more often adult type uh, diseases and processes in our pediatric populations just because of these sorts of things. And I feel like I've seen uh, younger heart attacks than ever over the last 10 years, um, you know, 20s and 30s and people who shouldn't really have it just based on uh, life, livelihood, exercise or not exercising, diet, uh, things like that, you know, adult-related diseases in younger and younger people because of our Western lifestyle and diet. So we've made it through cardiomyopathy, number three. You can have a comment before number three if you like. Oh, yeah. Um, number three, I'm going to keep you in suspense, but I completely agree with you in that, you know, we just have to do our best with what we have, and you don't want to minimize and you don't want to maximize. And sometimes people do the right thing for the wrong reason. We get the right referral for the wrong reason. So everyone's panicking and they send it to you. And what is our human instinct to say, oh brother, why are you here? Uh, but you know, let's, let's do our best. I have, to, I have to remind myself to to put that out of the situation and try to say, well, now that I see this person with new eyes, what can I do? What What is it that I can do that can make a positive impact on their health care today? Okay, so next up is the Goldilocks of the intervals, it's QT, abnormal QT. Don't want it too long, don't want it too short. So I feel like with a lot of these things, you see, you're reading a textbook, you see this little table in the corner and you go, okay, here are all the causes and you go, yeah, yeah, I got it. And it doesn't quite filter through. So a few, th a few ways I feel like it's easier to remember at the bedside, you see the EKG, what should trigger in your mind is sort of this pattern recognition. So we'll start with long. So long QT, anything that, so I call this long QTs are by the hypos or the antis. So the prolonged QT is anything that's hypo or fighting against. So hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypothermia, uh, hypomagnesemia, all of those hypos we'll call as prolonged QT. You know, you knew that already, but here's another way to remember it. Uh, the other thing is the antis, so all the antipsychotics, antiarrhythmics, antidepressants, antihistamines, all of those things can also cause prolonged QT, which is why it's important anytime we're looking at the ECG to get a good med history. You may be born with it, and uh, there are all kinds of long QT syndromes from 1 to 15. That is sort of the grab bag that we used to call Romano Ward syndrome, but now that we have actual genetic testing, we can call it for what it is. The uh, the one that's with congenital deafness is sort of a little bit of a weirdo that you don't need to know for every day, but it's uh, Dravel Lang Nielsen. That you'll know that though because the child will come in already with that diagnosis. In other words, it can be acquired with the hypos and the antis, or it can be congenital. 
What do we do with that? We have to recognize it. We have to treat what are the abnormal uh, underlying pathology is and then potentially keep that person in until the EVER has been repleted or they get the proper follow-up. You also have short QT and I kind of think of this short, so it's sort of hyper. So all of the hypers, the hypercalcemia and hyperdigoxinemia. So hypercalcemia, if you see an EKG on somebody complaining of everything hurts, I hate my life, I feel very fatigued, get an EKG, it's a good idea. And you see that QT is really short, you really have to ask yourself, does this person have cancer, for example, right? Hypercalcemia. So it's funny how you would make that leap, but we really are responsible for that thought process. We are detectives and that we try to burrow into a good history and physical, but we also kind of are victims of a medical CSI evaluation, right? Because anything that we touch diagnostically, therapeutically, can go back later on, years later, and say, Dr. Stanton, why didn't you notice that there is a short QT in this, uh, in this person? It's kind of crazy the world we live in, but that's why we have to look at these things primarily to help that person right in front of us, but also to make sure that we have good, sustainable careers. So hypercalcemia, short QT, uh, hyperdigoxinemia. Remember that the digoxin effect kind of looks like that Salvador Dali mustache. It looks abnormal, that QT. It looks like that swooping down of half of his mustache. It's important to recognize that that is normal in digoxin effect, but the QT can, is short often and can be hidden in that little swoop. So just try to remember, if someone's on digoxin, ask yourself, hey, wait a minute, is the QT okay? Because it may be too short because their digoxin levels are just super therapeutic or even someone within the therapeutic general range may just be toxic even on the upper end of normal. You can be born with short QT, of course, and again, that is sort of made by uh, diagnosis through the cardiologist. It's not something for us to really do too much, but if you see a QT that's too short for no reason, we really should get more people on board. And if that is a cardiology consult or that is a, um, an admission and observation, it'll depend on how the person arrives to you, how the child arrives to you. And a lot of that has to do with getting that history of what has already been done this. I mean, that's the first question you've got. It's, did you know about this? And then if so, what has been done about it? Because a lot of them are going to say, oh yeah, we're followed by uh, pediatric cardiology at so-and-so fantastic tertiary fancy schmancy medical center with super smart people in long white coats that do things about this type of thing. And you, you don't have to go down rabbit holes that have already been searched. Um, so that history is important. And I even with adults with that left bundle branch block, you know, it, left bundle branch block was a lot bigger deal when I was in residency than it uh, is now. I mean, used to, it's, you know, it's, if they didn't know about it, they're going to the cath lab. Well, good luck with that. I mean, I find it more often now um, that it's not. It's an admission with a change in evaluation, but it's not necessarily immediately going to the cath lab unless there's other acute coronary syndrome type complaints. But, you know, getting back to why I mentioned that is, you know, going in there and saying, did you know about this? Oh, yes. I know I've got a left bundle branch block, or they've told me I have a change a change on my EKG that makes it wide. Uh, you know, they may not be able to know the exact term, but with pediatrics, exact same way. With this congenital type stuff, ask if they know about it and what their uh, plan is and who do they follow up with. Not only if you've got concerned people you can reach out to that know the patient, um, so the person you're consulting may not be starting from zero, uh, but also then um, knowing that that's already been addressed and you don't have to go down that uh, that pathway as well. So that's uh, number three. Yeah. Back to four. Back to four. You know, and, and that's key what you're saying is to just find out what has been going on. And it's not weakness. It's, we can do anything in the emergency department. As long as it's within those four walls, we can do anything we need to do. It's not weakness to ask for more help. It's really benefiting the patient. And it's funny, it's amazing how many times you go through a full history and physical and the patient doesn't mention anything about anything. And then as the, sort of the doorknob diagnosis, it's the, uh, the curtain uh, comment is, oh, so when are you gonna call my cardiologist? And, you know, what are you talking about? So, you know, it's sort of a two-way street. Part of it is it would be nice if patients uh, were able to answer and be sort of good advocates for themselves, but at the same time, they just expect us 
to know. Somehow we have this like Wi-Fi connection, Ryan, like with all of us, we have this kind of group mentality. We understand we can get medical records at, at the drop of a hat across the country, right? It's easy. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not really their fault for giving, we give them that impression. But on the other hand, we need to dig, we need to ask explicitly like you did, what else is going on and is this, am I the first person to ever talk to you about this? Oh, you're not, oh great, you're on this medication, you have this follow-up, good, I feel more secure, we don't necessarily have to start from scratch. Alright, so the next one we could talk about is Brugada Syndrome. And, you know, we talk about Brugada syndrome all day, every day, right? And I feel like with some of these conditions that are really cool to talk about, that everybody loves to talk about, to me, sometimes it kind of goes in one ear out the other because you sort of become numb to it. Like, yeah, 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 I know all about it. But there are often times where we can refresh what we know, also build on what we know. So what I mentioned in lecture was, of course, we all know it's a sodium channelopathy, that what happens here is that some of those cells are just lazy and repolarizing, and they're not ready for that next depolarization. So they're in a vulnerable period. You hit them with another repolarization, and it's sort of like an RNT phenomenon, which is why they have the polymorphic VTAC. We're not worried about their sodium channels per se. We're worried about the, dynamis the, the, the dynamicism of it. We're worried about physiologically what they can handle. So it's sort of a ticking time bomb Brugada. You may have Brugada syndrome and never have any issues your whole life. Or you may come in, you stub your toe, someone happens to do an EKG on you, and now you know, congratulations, you have Brugada probably. That brings me to the second point, is that to really call it Brugada, you need to have ECG findings, which are not perfect and they're not necessarily pathognomonic, and clinical findings. That's fine, but the problem is that the cardiologists can sometimes be a little bit strict with this. What they're trying to do is they're trying to make a very accurate diagnosis. What we're trying to do is we're trying to just make sure we're keeping this person safe. We don't necessarily need a definitive diagnosis when we talk to them. But I, I want to just mention a few things that are in their mind because I think if we know where they're coming from, it might help with the communication. Mm -hmm. So they might say, oh, oh, yeah, so very skeptical, right? Hmm, Brugada, yes, that sounds like I don't think it is, but sure, tell me more. And they're going to ask you, well, is there a documented VFib or VTAC? Hopefully not. <laughs> It probably came in because they self-corrected. Is there any family history of sudden cardiac death in less than a 45-year-old? That's a fair question, and we should always ask it. So thank you. Thank you for prompting me. Well, what are the ECG findings in family members? Like, well, that's why I'm admitting this person to you. Uh, well, was, is there VTAC or VFib on EP studies? No, again, balls in your court, buddy. Was there syncope associated with this EKG? That's probably why you did the EKG. There's something weird going on. And then the other thing, part of their criteria is, was there nocturnal agonal respirations, which I'm not sure I'm keeping patients that long. I don't know, are you, Ryan, keeping patients in your department to find out if they stop breathing because they have Brugada syndrome? I mean, this whole thing sounds like uh, a hot mess. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like, I've, I, my goal is to have this person here less than two hours. Yeah. And you're asking me to do a sleep study on them. Yeah. Um, to assault all of the family members, just start throwing electrodes, which I feel like sometimes happens in our emergency departments. We feel like we get enough EKGs that we're probably doing some people who aren't actually patients. Um, and then, you know, then your other questions is, has this person ever tried to die before? And, um, I mean, that seems like that would have been something we would have already investigated yeah. if they had tried that. You know, I mean, it's not like a seizure where you get one freebie. I mean, you try to die, yeah. you know, V-fib or significant VTAC, um, yeah, that's something that's probably already been evaluated. So, you know, that expectation that we are going to complete that entire cardiology workup is probably a little bit outlandish. It's kind of our jam resuscitation. We know when people die, we, we figure that stuff out, right? So anyway, um, the uh, ECG findings that uh, you may or may not see, remember, it's a dynamic physiologic issue. It's not an imprinted accessory path that you're going to see always. So just because you have a normal EKG doesn't mean they don't have Brugada syndrome. But let's just play ball, right? Because there's no crying in baseball and there's no napping in the ED, no sleep studies, right? So <laughs> what we're going to we'll look at is three different types. It's not so important that we remember the exact types, but remember, I kind of think of it this way. It's a right bundle branch block looking pattern with STT wave changes. If, if I think of it that way, then I don't worry about type 1, 2, and 3. I just say, hey, does it look like a right bundle? Is there some weird STT wave changes after that? That's enough for me. But 
To be a little bit more specific, the type one is the more specific type is the cove-like pattern where you see your right bundle branch block and then the uh, QRS complex juts up and then sort of go, looks like a, a ski slope going down. It looks very abnormal it looks, or a shark fin or however you want to remember. I, I know that you can see this in your mind's eye as you're listening because you've seen this before. That coved type one is the most specific. The other two are the saddle back ones that look like a horse's saddle. And to remember them, I just think of it type two is saddle up, type three is saddle down. So the saddle up is the elevation, saddle down is the depression. Uh, and that's really all you need to know. In other words, right bundle branch block with uh, STT wave changes. Uh, it's important for us to be advocates for our patients because they may not perfectly, their EKG may not look exactly perfectly like the cardiologists are uh, expecting. And remember too, this is really um, something that is in a sub-subspecialty. So this is the electrophysiologist realm. And that's a subspecialty of cardiology, a subspecialty. So the general cardiologist, especially the non-interventional cardiologist, may or may not be really in tune to this. And it, again, it's like we're talking about human nature and trying not to, you know, trigger too many bad reflexes that we have ingrained in us. If you go in talking to the cardiologist and acting like you know what's up and not asking them for their input or their opinion, they're going to balk and say, well, it's not exactly this and push back on you. And that's not going to help the patient. So really, we just have to be humble and say, hey, you know, this is what I'm concerned about. I know it's not the end of the story, but uh, what are the next steps that we can do. If we make this diagnosis, or the cardiologist really does, uh, they may start the patient on beta blockers to try to prevent the, the polymorphic VTAC. But really the real answer, the real gold, gold standard, the criterion standard, is putting an ICD. Because if, gonna, if they go into VTAC, I don't care how much metoprolol you're on, that's not going to change going into this dangerous rhythm. So the whole point is, if you go into the rhythm, what is going to happen to you? You have an ICD in place, you're great. It's better to prevent, but it's also uh, important on the spot to treat them for their life-threatening dysrhythmia. So you mentioned uh, some of that criteria, looking at those ST changes. I mean, we've we talked about um, some of those, um, you know, benign early repolarization things like that. How do we? How can we tell if that is actually a significant change in that uh, ST wave? So benign early repol, I, I kind of think of along the lines of, you know, does this person have pericarditis, myocarditis, or benign early repo. Um, again, all of those things happen in the same patient, right? And the young, healthy person could have pericarditis and look relatively well, but just kind of, they don't look totally right, right? They just, their, their chest pain is really nagging. It's just not, it's not like, ha ha, I happen to have chest pain. Where's my phone, you know, right? So, um, Oh, you know, so this is sort of our, this is the bonus track. I'll give you it in, in, in the end. But um, pericarditis, myocarditis, uh, and benign early repoll sort of look a lot alike on the EKG. And again, it's the patient plus the EKG. To tell the difference between the two really is, it's going to be clinical. But as we remember, pericarditis will have widespread ST elevation with PR depression in non-anatomical leads. So it'll, it'll look all over the place. It won't follow a, a coronary artery. Having said that though, sometimes it's difficult and sometimes pericarditis looks a little bit more focal than not. So one way that, this is just a refresher for us all, we look at both of them and we know that the ST uh, in both pericarditis and benign early repoll, that the ST segment and the T wave are both elevated. But the question in our mind is how elevated is one versus the other? In pericarditis, you're really looking at the ST elevation, which is much more prominent than a little bit of extra T wave uh, elevation as well. In pericarditis, you're going to see the T wave is big and the ST segment just happens to be a little bit big. So the way that we can quantify this is there was a great study that was done that looked at uh, V5 and V6. And if you measure the actual height of the ST elevation and you measure the height separately of the T wave elevation, you look at that ratio. So the ST to T wave ratio, you, you divide them, you divide those two millimeter values. If you find that that ratio is less than 0 0.25, then it's most likely going to be benign early repolarization. If you find that that, uh, that that ratio, the ST segment in millimeters over the T wave in millimeters, you find that ST ratio to be greater than or equal to 0 0.25, then this is most likely to be pericarditis. It's a nice little way to draw the line in the sand. 
Um, the other thing that we should mention is the fish hook sign. So in Benign really Repo, we all remember sort of this LVH looking thing, maybe some ST elevation, uh, etc. But you have that little notch right after the QRS. That's called the fish hook sign, and that's going to be more likely to be benign early repo. Again, we're sort of going with probabilities, putting the patient in consideration and the findings that we find. Nothing's perfect, but we put it all together, throw it in the hopper, see what comes out. Uh, we also mentioned a little bit about spodic sign, which is not the most reliable, but all that really is, just as a refresher, is you have the, uh, in um, pericarditis, you have the STT wave elevation, and then you kind of have this down sloping until you get to the PR depression and then another beat. Mm -hmm. So it sort of looks, it, it's an artifact. It really looks like a down sloping. It's only because one segment, the ST was elevated, and now the PR is depressed, and there's that connecting um, portion where there's no electrical activity is that slope. That slope is called spodic sign. So that might be another thing that would draw you to thinking it's going to be pericarditis. So we got our bonus material there. So we got Brugada's number four. We went into our little uh, bonus uh, material. And now we're going to have, we're going to return back to number five. Number five is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. This is one of the kind of less common ones, but it's one of those that if you can see it on EKG, you can save a life. So just very briefly, uh, you may be born with a genetic abnormality that causes um, apoptosis in the right ventricle in a triangle shape. And this could happen to a baby. This could happen to a 20-year-old, 30-year-old. So you're going to see it all over the place. What happens there is that you have early cell death, apoptosis, and then you have fatty infiltration and scarring from there, causing this permanently, this, this sort of this patch of non-functional myocardium in the right ventricle. This, of course, can cause any dysrhythmia, and what you'll see is what's called the epsilon wave. So you'll see this sort of like humpback at the end of the QRS complex. It looks like an E in syncope that fell flat in its face with the three little humps. So think of it anterior. In the anterior leads, V1, V2, that E in syncope just fell flat on its face and you see this epsilon wave, this bump in the epsilon. That's going to be something that's going to need to get followed up with an echo and a cardiologist because you really want to get that person in to be seen. Again, started on beta blockers or an ICD. Not very common, but if you find that pattern, the epsilon wave, you could potentially save a life. So five plus fantastic things to look for on pediatric EKGs with uh, Dr. Tim Horechko. And uh, so how can folks get more information from you, hear more from you, um, email, social media, um, whatever? I'm uh, on Twitter at EM Together. Also on my podcast, The Pediatric Emergency Medicine Playbook. You can email me at coach at PEMplaybook.org. So the Pediatric Emergency Medical Playbook, uh, another one to uh, add there, fantastic information, and actually uh, one of the very few um, EKG discussions that I've been able to process in quite some time. So uh, good information, and you know all, everything we've had here are five plus things to look for, um, are important things that you can um, do to look deeper into, look further into, look for those EKGs, look for those changes that he's uh, talking about because are, those are some really cool little facts and even, you know, even putting together a little, um, little, some sort of uh, a sheet uh, that has some of those cool little changes and things to look for if you're in a facility like mine that's going to have such uh, low volume. So, uh, Tim, thanks for joining us here on the front line. Ryan, thank you. I enjoyed it and thank you for being on the front line for us. I know it is, it is a, a cool, witty thing about being on the uh, front lines of emergency medicine. As for me, you can email me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, at everydaymed on Twitter. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.